Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you for, for coming. And so uh, because in the spirit of this being an a, 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 a institute of advanced study that involves a lot of different people, I also a lot of different disciplines, um, the emphasis in my talk is going to be on applications and applications that span different disciplines and how we've been able to take some of the basic plasmonic properties that Peter has explained really beautifully in his talk and use them, uh, utilize them in, in, in some uh, uh, areas, applications that are, that are, are, are relatively far, far reaching. So <clears throat> the, Peter gave a wonderful scientific uh, explanation of uh, surface plasmons and plasmonic nanoparticles. And of course, they were realized in ancient times. This beautiful goblet is found in the British Museum and is from Roman times. And I'm sure you've seen it in nanotechnology uh, uh, textbooks, chemistry textbooks in high schools even have pic pictures of this beautiful goblet. And it, the, the color of this, the light absorbing properties are due to gold, and, gold nanoparticles, which of course, no one in 2000 years ago understood how they made them, but in fact, they, they did. And this was also uh, a technology that was propagated by alchemists throughout the Middle Ages. So the beautiful stained glass windows that are that, that you see so often uh, in historical buildings in Europe. <clears throat> the red is also gold nanoparticles. And sort of in the modern era, Michael Faraday, who was a fabulous uh, uh, public speaker and communicator of science, used to carry a little vial of gold nanoparticles in his in his uh, 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 demonstrations when he gave public lectures and in fact you can find in the not in the British Museum but the British Museum of Technology has a large um, a, a large container of, uh, of, of Faraday's colloid which people called it at, at the time gold nanoparticles which are still stable today uh, that were that were that he made during his lifetime so <clears throat> that's sort of the starting point for many people of their, their familiarity with gold nanoparticles of course um, as Peter explained, with, with metals, they have very interesting properties. When we think of macroscopic, when we think of macroscopic film of gold and you shine light on it, it reflects light. Right? But if it's very small, then light can couple in, light can either be absorbed by the nanoparticle at a well-defined plasmon resonance, in which case, of course, it's no longer gold, it, it is by element, but the appearance is, in fact, due to the plasmon resonance. So here, when a nanoparticle, when, when, when gold is shrunk to nanoscale size, it absorbs green light and then gives rise to the, you see, of course, transmitting the, the complementary color red, and that's why this uh, appears red to the eye. So it's the light absorption that is very important and gives rise to two properties, as Peter mentioned. So Peter talked a lot about hot electrons, but of course, when you shine light on a particle and it's absorbing light, that converts light to heat very, very efficiently. So photothermal properties as well as hot electron properties are very, very important. So in our own work, we began to um, think about this actually a very long time ago. Uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, and we took an example from um, from the, th the theoretical literature from early from early 1950s. In fact, after we started playing around with it, then we discovered, yes, of course, this was such a clever idea that, of course, someone r had thought about it mo decades and decades ago, and that was because of spherical symmetry. Right, the simple simplest way to vary a solid sphere is to make it hollow. And so we figured out a way to make, uh, of course, shell nanoparticles, in which case you now can tune the shape of, an, of, of the metal. When you change the shape of the metal, you change its color. So in this case, we change it in a very symmetric way. We can tune the thickness of, a, of, of the gold shell on a nanoparticle, and then we can tune its color. And so <clears throat> very early, well, this is, this is sort of an example of where plasmonics is now from starting of, of just manipulating, the idea of manipulating uh, the, the, the shape of, of, of metallic nanoparticles has extended quite extraordinarily into whole new realms of physics, as Peter illustrated, and to, has given rise to fields like nanophotonics, nanoscale optics, as Peter referred to, and also metasurfaces, uh, wavelength, uh, wavelength conversion, conversion, for example, in nonlinear optics. Uh, the chemists have been very interested in the ability to sense very few molecules, as, as Peter mentioned, and then even to transform molecules uh, using hot electrons and photochemistry. Uh, and of course, with hot electrons, we can develop new active, uh, act, active types of devices, and then uh, we can look at applications. And so the two applications that have been very popular are biomedical applications, and then also uh, light harvesting and, and for, for a, different, a variety of different applications within, uh, w w within the context of sustainability. So those are two areas that I'll focus on. So I have an outline. My, I'm going to talk to you about three applications. 
Uh, the first one is photothermal cancer therapy. I'll tell you our story and how that has progressed now to being in people and, uh, and, and, and well on the way to, uh, to really revolutionizing a certain type of cancer therapy. Um, and then some work that we've done with uh, using sunlight <coughs> to, to vaporize liquids and how that can now, has now led to some ideas for, uh, for, for, for water remediation uh, without that are off grid, right? That really use sunlight uh, fully. And also, as Peter mentioned, he started a great story about plasmonic photocatalysis, and we're going to continue more and talk a bit, a bit about hydrogen on demand. So, <clears throat> so we start with photothermal cancer therapy. So I showed you this coarse shell nanoparticles that we, that we developed a long time ago. One of the first things we asked, first questions we asked, well, what, what could these be useful for? And very early on, we teamed up with bioengineers who were familiar enough with optical properties to know that if you look across the visible spectrum and then you look just to the red of the visible spectrum, <clears throat> you enter a little spectral region here, 700 to 900 nanometers, called the water window. So we're basically big bags of water. We're about 70% water. So this is, so, so just as water is, is minimally absorptive and maximally transparent in the near infrared in the, in the spectral region, so are we. And so this is a region where blood is essentially transparent and tissue scatters light, but it doesn't absorb light particularly well. So light can penetrate, depending on the type of tissue, several centimeters into the body. Uh, so what we did with our nanoparticles was we knew about the spectral window. We could place the resonance, tune the resonance of the nanoparticles into that spectral window. So instead of the tissue being able to absorb light, if the nanoparticles were embedded in tissue, then they could preferentially absorb light. And our focus was photothermal effects, so they could very easily convert light to heat. So how could those then be used? So we then developed this idea of photothermal cancer therapy. So you take the nanoshells that we, that we first uh, uh, developed. If you, if, if you have, so for example, here we have a, a tumor that's grown on the flank of, of a mouse. And if you inject the nanoshells not into the tumor, but just into the tail vein, they will circulate throughout the body. And over the course of several hours, they will uh, end up depositing in the tumor without any specific, any special antibodies or anything else, just a matter of size. So anything that's about 100 nanometers in diameter will take up in the tumor vasculature. So then you wait uh, eight hours, 10 hours, and then irradiate use the light, of course. You can sh shine the light directly through the skin and into the tumor. And uh, then, the, the, then the, the, the nanoparticles will absorb the light, convert the light to heat, and then, uh, and then by, by, by um, the, the localized heating, then convert the light to, um, to, to, to heat and then tumor remission. <clears throat> So this worked extremely well when we first demonstrated it. We started a company. We began to, uh, the company then began to work for, towards clinical trials. Uh, and this has actually been in humans for about a decade. And um, it started in, in, in head and neck cancer, and then it moved into a, 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 a trial on prostate cancer in, uh, in Mexico City. And so, with the, so the prostate cancer trial looked interesting at the time, but there was actually a problem there was a problem with this. And let me tell you a little bit about prostate cancer, if you don't mind me <clears throat> talking about this. My father was a prostate cancer survivor, so uh, it's a very common cancer. It is, um, it, it, it's, it's very common. It's the third most deadly cancer in men in the U.S. Uh, in, uh, after skin cancer and lung cancer. And <clears throat> so how is prostate cancer, um, how is prostate cancer diagnosed? It's first diagnosed with a, a medical exam and then measuring the, uh, the, the PSA level. And then a biopsy is performed. And um, so the biopsy, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. And after the biopsy, there is a therapy. And all of the conventional therapies are, they're very well known, but they unfortunately uh, really reduce the quality of life. So they lead to, to really deleterious effects like incontinence and ED. So, <clears throat> one would uh, one would like to avoid that uh, avoid that of course, but let me talk to you a little bit about how how how, uh, how, how prostate cancer is uh, is diagnosed. So uh, back around when we when we when the the company first did this uh, for, first for, first did their their uh, um, their their clinical trial, <clears throat> the, the the results were, were were sort of hit and miss. And why why is that? And the reason is because nobody could image the prostate. So this is, one technology can often depend on another technology to, uh, to advance. 
And so in 2010, all prostate imaging was basically done with an ultrasound. And you can see the prostate gland. It's about a one inch in diameter gland. Um, and uh, when it was biopsied, it was just basically needles were inserted randomly. So if there was some cancerous region, one could miss the cancerous region. And then in about 2012, there was a revolution. And the revolution was in imaging. So people began to realize that this is basically software. They, they were able to, to merge images from MRI and ultrasound, and that enabled them to produce a very detailed image of the prostate. Um, this ties into what I'm going to say in a moment. So <laughs> you can now see the internal region. You have a region where the red arrow shows that is actually a suspected region. And so then that led into the ability to actually do an, a, a, to, to, to look inside the prostate and do a, a biopsy all at the same time. So you can see this is called a, a, an image guided biopsy. So they could actually insert a needle just precisely in this region where, um, where, where, where there was a suspected tumor. This increased the number of diagnoses by more than a factor of two. And so this was this precision revolution that then enabled one to say, <clears throat> in fact, I'll tell you in a moment who, who, who did, said this, enabled one to say that, that, that if we can actually insert a needle into a biopsy in this region, then perhaps we can do very, very localized therapy by inserting an optical fiber. So <clears throat> the fusion biopsy then a revolutionized diagnosis so then the next question is, what about treatment? So instead of doing these conventional treatments, which are very invasive, why don't we use nanoshells, which have a commercial name of oralase therapy as the first line of defense? So I just showed you how this works with, um, with in, in mice. So the question is, can we do this in humans? And so the people who answer that question, I'm of course not a medical doctor. This is eventually, this, this moved into the medical realm. And so the, the, so the young man, Art Rostenhad, who had been the clinical researcher who developed the actual biopsy himself realized, well, the next step would be to insert an optical fiber and to do the, th the therapy. So he connected up with, um, he, so he connected up this idea of, of, of the biopsy with, 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 photothermal, uh, with, with photothermal heating and nanoshells. So he started a, 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 a clinical trial and he uh, affiliated uh, um, uh, two, other research, two other researchers, one in Michigan and one at, at the University of Texas and enrolled patients so they could actually perform what I just showed you in this very simple, uh, this very sim simple uh, uh, cartoon on, on, um, on, on humans. So. Oral lace therapy is an investigational device for the precise thermal destruction of lesions in the prostate. The therapy is based on the unique properties of proprietary gold microparticles called aura shells. These inert, non-toxic particles are approximately 150 nanometers in diameter, or about 50 times smaller than a red blood cell. In the first stage of oral lase therapy, a solution containing aura shells is infused into the bloodstream of the patient, allowing them time to collect the lesion. Most cancerous lesions have poorly formed blood supplies, leaving small holes in the blood vessels that the aura shells are small enough to pass through, leading to an accumulation of the particles in the target area. <coughs> in the second part of the therapy, Laser light is applied to the lesion previously located using MRI. Using an ultrasound probe and the images from the MRI to guide the physician, a trocar is placed into the lesion, distant from critical structures. A fiber optic catheter is inserted using the cannula, precisely where treatment is desired. When the laser is fired, the aura shell particles near the laser fiber absorb the laser light and become hot, raising the temperature of the lesion to a point where cell death occurs. After the procedure, the body reabsorbs the dead tissue and the lesion heals. Okay, so this, uh, so, so this trial has been going on for actually uh, just a little bit longer than two years. And so this is the, so the procedure I showed you with a mouse is exactly what a human being encounters. One, one morning they get injected with a nanoparticle solution and the next morning they undergo the, the therapy that was just illustrated there. So more than 25 patients, actually patient 26 was, was just, uh, uh, um, uh, was treated, uh, less than two weeks ago. And, um, 
there basically there are no well so, so this is some some of the results from patient number one his name is martin feely and he had um a little bit of discomfort one day he the procedure was performed on tuesday and he rode a bike on friday we have no idea why um but he also had he also had a romantic weekend with his wife that same weekend so it was more information than we needed to know um <laughs> but, but but what's really very exciting is that this is now moving now to this is now a three clinical sites and, uh, and, and the patients are encountering very, basically no side effects whatsoever. And so this is something that we think is really very exciting. So on to a, another and very different application. Although when I used to talk about cancer therapy, this has been going on for a long time uh, for out of our laboratory and into the clinic, as you can see. Um, there would always, there was always, always be somebody who, when I talked about cancer therapy who would say, wait a minute, why can't you use, um, is my computer freezing? Said, why can't you use this for? Um, here we go. Why, why, why can't you use uh, photothermal uh, heating for solar harvesting solar energy? Okay. <clears throat> so here we are. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So somebody would always ask that question, and so we began to play around with this idea, and. So we thought well, this would be interesting to see what we can do with um, making steam because we would all like to, we all know how to make steam. We make steam by boiling water. And so what we typically do is we take some volume of water and we heat it with a thermal source. And then we wait a long time because you have to put a lot of energy in to heat the water. Then you have the enthalpy of vaporization. So eventually you will get steam, but if you're impatient, you can take water and light absorbing nanoparticles. Any light source, sunlight is just fine and you'll produce steam immediately. You'll produce steam at a high efficiency, which depends on the nanoparticle concentration, but you'll do this even if it sits in an ice, ice bath. Okay. So you're, we've, in a certain sense, decoupled steam generation from, from water heating. And so how do we do this? I'll show you a si very simple video. So I need to describe the video first. Um, so we have a solution of nanoparticles and a thermocouple in the bottom, and we stick this in an ice bath, and then we focus sunlight onto this a small test tube, and we have a little plug of oil at the top to show that we generate steam. And so, so we have a timer here for dramatic effect in the thermocouple at the bottom, and here's our, here's our solar simulator. We really use the sun. We focus sunlight, and within about 10 seconds or so, we, we make steam generation, so it's very quick. And so if we look in a little bit more detail at this experiment, so we do the, now the same experiment again. So again, we use a solar source, the real solar source. And we put, take a beaker of, of nanoparticles. We use focused sunlight. We have a thermocouple in the bottom, but we also place the whole thing on an analytical balance. So when we lose, the mass loss is all due to steam generation. And so if we take a, 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 any kind of light, light absorbing nanoparticle will do. And if we watch the temperature increase, of course, it's, it, 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 it's, it scales with, uh, with, with it's basically the heat capacity of water at times the, the, the mass. And so the smaller the mass, the larger the temperature increase for the same amount of time. But then if we measure the mass loss, it's identical and it doesn't matter how much mass we have. And if we look at how much the, um, the, the energy that we consume is, about 80% of the energy goes directly into steam generation and very little goes into fluid heating. So what is going on here? That puzzled us until we began to study this and we began to realize that this is actually a, a really beautiful part of physics that's related to light scattering. It's related to Anderson, weak Anderson localization of light but in the presence of absorption. So it's an interesting optical regime that the optical physicists had not studied because, they, because absorption interferes with, with, with our understanding of effects like localization of light. However, in this case, we want absorption. Absorption is, re is, is responsible for the energy transduction and for the heating. So <clears throat> we began to study this effect. And so you can see, so this is just a simulation of a little cuvette in a laboratory and a laser light coming down and the nanoparticles that are there. And so the nanoparticles individually, photon by photon, will either be absorbed, the photon will be absorbed, or it will scatter maybe once, maybe twice. Uh, depending on the concentration and eventually be absorbed. <clears throat> but this will all be the effect of the absorption plus the scattering is to concentrate the, um, is, to, is, is to concentrate the light energy absorbed by the solution just to the interface between, be, between, the, the, um, between air and the liquid. So you can so show through our, our, our simulations, this shows the, where the light is absorbed in the histogram. And this also explains the ice bath experiment. 
<clears throat> so we can see that, of course, we have high absorption at the top of the vial, and then we have minimal uh, temperature change at the bottom of the, of the vial, which is exactly what we see, what we see experimentally. And so this is a very strong effect, and we began to use this for some very simple applications, and one of them was to, base, to, was to make an autoclave. So by, by, so by using the same sol solar steam generation, we could sterilize and pressurize a, um, an autoclave. Autoclaves are used in, in the laboratory to, for sanitation, uh, and they are very useful for, uh, for example, medical teams that go to developing countries, dental teams. They're the, one of the, of the um, largest constraints for medical uh, missions in the developing world is sanitation. You need chemicals to sanitize. So about a third of the, of, of the, of the mass that they bring when they go on to uh, medical missions are the sterilization chemicals. Here you can do sterilization with no chemicals and with, 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 with actually off-grid, so you use just the solar light and you can get it to temperatures where you can do uh, very effective sterilization, even of viruses, uh, in just a few minutes. So, <clears throat> we also, um, so, so we also converted this to, um, to, to uh, it's, it's fun to, 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 to make steam, but then we also thought well, it would be interesting to look at different types of liquids. So why don't we try look at distillation? So distillation of, for example, water ethanol mixtures, that's of course, uh, that's of course making vodka, and so that's very interesting to many, many people. But, dist but distillation as itself, th this is one of the I interesting aspects of sustainability. Distillation is an enormous uh, consu consu consumer of energy, just as chemistry is. Peter met, di didn't really mention that in his talk, but we'll talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> but just the idea of separating chemicals. Once you make chemicals and you produce a bunch of products, the cost of, uh, of the energy that, that is consumed to make them is often less than the energy that's consumed to separate them. And so, uh, so for example, if you look at, 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 the, at, at, at the separation of, uh, of, of different chemicals that are needed for fuels, and one example is bioethanol, more than three quarters of the, approximately three quarters of the energy cost is in the separation of the chemicals that are actually made. And so we did a very simple experiment uh, and where we just we went outside and we showed our, did our nanoparticles in sunlight, and instead of shining this on water, we shone this on, on a water ethanol mixture, and we found that and compared it to a thermal source, and we found that we had a much, much greater amount of distillate uh, for, um, for, for in a, a shorter period of time, which we thought, well, this is quite interesting. So it, it, when we compared it carefully with the thermal, with, with, the, with the equivalent experiment with the thermal source, that we found that this was actually a much more efficient process. But in the case of ethanol, we found something very interesting. We actually were very, we found a distillation that was far different than what one finds thermally. So uh, the blue curve is familiar from many PCAM textbooks where you, set, where you, you have a water ethanol separation and at, when you hit about 90% mole fraction, 95% mole fraction, they cannot be separated. It's a mixture called an azeotrope. But <clears throat> when you do light-induced distillation, it finds that you find that the ethanol that is produced uh, is produced much drier with much, much less water uh, and is produced very, very easily. So, the, so all of these kind of led up to uh, to us looking at uh, light for, uh, at, at light and, and distillation or variations of distillation for um, for for water treatment. So this is of course a huge global problem, and it's not a problem in Denmark. You have wonderful water here, but in so many parts of the world, there's actually there's roughly a billion people who lack access to safe water. And of course, industry by and large makes it worse, whether it's agriculture or, or, or oil and gas industry, and they produce just a huge amount of, of, of water that has a, a, a very, a very problematic and often intractable um, uh, um, uh, uh, contaminants. And so uh, if we think about just the problem of desalination, for example, so desalination, there's 18,000 uh, desalination plants, and so they produce enough water for 1,625 cities the size of Odense. And the problem with desalination, we know how de desalination and distillation are e easy processes to handle, but the problem with desalination is exactly the same problem that you have with, with distillation, and that is the energy cost to actually make perform the process is a huge, huge fraction. So we, when we think about desalination plants, you have to realize that it's not the cost of building a plant, it's the cost of operating that makes this really a huge, huge uh, uh, energy burden. So, um, sorry about that. <coughs> So we began to look at a process that had been around for several decades called membrane distillation. Well, how am I on time, by the way? Oh, you're doing good. Okay. At least, uh, 15 minutes. Oh, oh, okay. 
Okay. <laughs> so, so, um, so membrane distillation, people know about reverse osmosis. When you get to, uh, as, as the water becomes, the, the salt concentration of water becomes higher and higher, reverse osmosis becomes more and more difficult to, uh, uh, more and more um, uh, um, energy, uh, 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 energy needing. Um, and so uh, uh, membrane distillation is, a, is a, an alternative that people have look, been looking at for a long period of time. And really, it is a 40 year, uh, 40 plus year, quote unquote, technology of the future. Let me explain how this works. So the idea is you have a membrane and you have water, the salt water that you want to purify is on one side of the membrane and the purified water flows on the other side of the membrane. So we're sort of looking at this as a counter flow. If you have a temperature difference between the hot water, a hotter, hotter water, it can just be a few degrees temperature difference, um, hotter water on one side and the cooler water on the other side, this temperature difference sets up a vapor pressure difference so that across the membrane you'll actually have a vaporization within the membrane and a condensation on the other side. And so <laughs> this is, um, the, so, so, so th this is very, very energy intensive because you have to heat all the input water. Like that's the key, that's the key issue. And so we thought, well, this, we could take this basic idea, this basic geometry, and we could convert this to a solar, uh, to, to a solar process. So here we're doing basically something very similar to what I showed you with nanoparticles and water and sunlight. Instead of having the nanoparticles embedded in a liquid, we have the nanoparticles embedded in a surface coating of the, uh, of the actual membrane. So they undergo the same scattering and absorption process that I showed you earlier, but now they're, they're stationary and they're in the, the first input several microns of, of, of the membrane within its coating. So and now we've taken the membrane process and we've converted it to a photothermal membrane. And so now we don't have to heat the input water. We just flow the water, same temperature on either side of the membrane. We flow the water and it is locally heated at the input face of the membrane. And then the heated water then is trans uh, be becomes vaporized through the membrane and condenses on the other side. So we call this, we couldn't think of, of a better acronym, so without thinking of a better acronym, we call it NESMD, nanophotonics enabled uh, solar membrane distillation. <coughs> And to do this, we don't use gold, uh, we use carbon black, anything that's light absorbing. And of course, this, uh, this, this absorbs a large spectrum of, of, of the solar radiation. Uh, and carbon black, by the way, is graphene. It's sort of, it's all sp2 carbon, so it's a kind of amorphous uh, 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 graphene. So it's, a, it's a, the, a form of graphene you're never going to see in a, in, a, in a science paper. And part of our understanding of how to Des how to design and how to uh, develop this really comes from our ideas of taking Maxwell's equations to describe a system like this, but then going a whole lot further. And so Alessandro Labastri and Peter Norlander have developed this way of, ta of taking not just we're starting with Maxwell's equations and understanding the light absorption, but then understanding also the fluid dynamics, the thermal transport and the mass transfer to, make, to understand all uh, aspects of this problem because it depends, of course, not just on energy absorption, but also fluid flow and, uh, and, and, and heat uh, propagation through a system like this. So, of course, we build a system like this, and this is all the, I don't have to tell you, show you all the details, but the photothermal membrane in this first system is quite small, three centimeters by eight centimeters, so it's relatively small. And, <clears throat> and we put it all in a box to keep the, the temperature stable. And the one thing you'll notice here is that there's really no, this is, this is on wheels. Okay, so we, uh, so whatever little power and so on that you might see here and there might be a solar panel to drive a pump or just taking data. So, um, you know, so, so some wires go out to, uh, to our PC to take the data. So we can see that we do this all, so this is all done with, as a solar process. So the little window that I showed you there is a Fresnel lens focusing on it. And we have uh, both the, 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 the uh, output, the distillate flux, that you can see on the uh, on this side is a function of time, and then this is also comparing experiment to theory. So I'm not going to go into the, the details of this, but the bottom line is that basically, as we understand the system, the theory predicts the experiment so very very well that we can now use theory to really begin to understand how this works and how to optimize the system. So the so, so, so this is now a, a, an example of what, we can, what, what theory can teach us. And if we look just at this middle panel here where we have the me memory distillation, so this is the light absorption, or the, I'm sorry, this is the, this is the temperature right, of uh, and the distillation. If we, if we do this in the dark with heat, with hot water, 
and then cold water on the other side. Of course, the hottest, the largest delta T is going to be just at the very, very beginning, right? And as the water, as the hot water flows, it's going to cool and it will eventually, it will eventually equilibrate with the cold water. Uh, and so you would have, of course, no vaporization. So you, it doesn't matter if you use conventional MD to make the membrane larger because all the action happens just at the very beginning where you have the delta T not equal to zero. But if your heat source is the sun and you're illuminating the entire panel, then of course as the water propagates it's going to get hotter and hotter and you can actually increase it. This now becomes a scalable system because it, it, it benefits from making the panel larger and larger. And so you can see the, 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 the curve, the solid curves on the, on the right actually show what happens for the solar process as you make the curve lar as, as you make the panel larger and larger. So the bottom line is that when you use, when, when you use a light absorptive process, the process scales up, but the conventional MD does not scale up. And <clears throat> the water doesn't have to flow particularly fast. If you slow down the water, then you have a full conversion. And, um, and if the system heats up, you actually have, uh, have, have a greater distillation, distillate flow. So for the little example that I showed you, if we scale this up to one meter by one meter, then a one square meter desalination panel, not a solar panel, but a solar desalination panel, could produce daily drinking water for three persons uh, without the use of fossil fuel. And with focusing, uh, which also is a, a, is a very, very interesting uh, aspect of the system because it turns out that this system is a, a, is a built-in nonlinearity. I'm not going to talk about that. But you actually could, can, this could scale up to, to daily drinking water for as many as, as, as 20 people in a one meter by one meter uh, solar, uh, solar desalination off-grid unit. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, to follow up on some of the things that Peter uh, began to talk about in his, um, in his presentation on plasmodic photocatalysis. So, um, so Peter mentioned, of course, that if you have, uh, when, you, when you excite a plasmon, the plasmon can decay by generating hot electrons. If the hot electrons ha are, as, are isoenergetic with, for example, a, lo the, uh, a, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, you can have electron transfer. You can also have scenarios where you have hole transfer. But you can actually ch you can change the charged state of a molecule, and you can induce dissociation. You can induce chemistry. So the idea of using hot electrons for chemistry has been around quite a long time, but, but what makes this so efficient is the fact that we're using localized plasmons, which can be very efficient. We now know much more about how, if, how efficiently we can generate hot, electron, uh, hot electrons and how we can now tie the energy of the hot electron to a specific, uh, to a, to a specific desorption process or do a specific electron uh, transfer process and tailor this to the chemical reaction. So we can, um, so, so, so this idea is, is, is very important, but one thing we didn't really talk about was, uh, was, was the, making the case in terms of sustainability. <clears throat> so this is sort of the dirty secret of the chemical industry. So we don't know that much about the chemical industry except that they consume a huge amount of energy and they didn't tell us how much energy they consume. They don't have to because they, they have their own energy reactors. I visited Dow Chemical Company uh, and um, uh, about three years ago, and they told me that w one of their reactors could power Chicago. And they're not on our grid, so we can, as government entities, cannot keep track of the energy that's consumed by, 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 by chemistry. But chemistry takes a huge amount of energy, as we, as, as, as we can see. So when it, this is an example. So, so on a decadal level, they, on a decadal time scale, they actually do reviews and they can share their, uh, their, their energy costs. So this was the last one, that the, the total energy bill in one year was $27 billion, which is 850,000 barrels of oil per day. And um, so one, one example, so we talked a little bit, a little bit about ammonia. Um, and of course, ammonia, when people think about ammonia, they don't think about decomposition. They, of course, think about ammonia generation because that's vital to life on Earth. And this is tied to one of the most important processes from the 20th century, the Haber-Bosch process, which is what we use to generate, um, to, 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 to make all of the uh, artificial fertilizer that's needed for, for the planet's crops. And so it consumes about 5% of the world's energy. So there's a huge interest, of course. Anyone who consumes that much energy really, really wants to figure out how to do the same chemistry to consume less energy, and so, and, and, uh, as do we. 
So the Haber-Bosch process is, of course, very, very well known as a large energy consumption. But if we just look at if we just look at nature's processes, we realize that <clears throat> certainly, you know, that back in the you know the traditional way to run a chemical reaction, of course, is to heat it. So heat and pressure are the tools that we've had around for you know decades, if not centuries, to run chemical reactions. But of course, there are processes, you know, enzymatic processes and other processes that involve light but do not involve going to higher temperatures and do involve higher selectivities. So part of plasmodic photocatalysis is really to say, can we leave some of these more conventional ways of running chemical reactions behind us and begin to look at more uh, natural, pro na na natural processes? So, um, <clears throat> so what do these companies have in common? Uh, lots of transportation companies here uh, from all over the place. There's some in Asia, some in Europe. So what do they have in common? So they have in common that they are all investing in fuel cells. It's all the cars that Professor and Denmark cannot afford. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Volkswagen? <laughs> so, okay. okay. So, so what is a fuel cell? So, so everyone is looking for the hydrogen economy, and people have been looking for, you know, so a, a fuel cell is, of course, a very straightforward way to, uh, to, to, to harvest energy if you had hydrogen that you could add to, to this very easily. And, of course, people have been looking for this for a long time. There have been really people have spent decades trying to figure out efficient ways to split water. So that's certainly one approach, but it's not the only approach. And so <clears throat> one, uh, so as Peter mentioned earlier, one of the problems with hydrogen uh, is that basically if we look at the standard ways of making hydrogen, that it is, it is really very, very expensive. So a very practical way to make hydrogen is to start with methane and to remove the hydrogen from methane. So there's a couple different ways. You can do it with oxygen. You can do it with what's called dry methane reforming CO2. You can also do this with, um, with water, right? So you use some oxygen containing, containing compound to reduce uh, to, to, to reduce the, the, meth the, the methane to hydrogen. And um, the problem with this is it's a high temperature industrial process. It's done around 800 degrees, 900 degrees. And um, so it's very costly. You have to build a big plant to do this. So there's other processes people have been looking at. And of course, um, of, of course, the issue, not just after you make it, then how do you deliver it? And that's where the whole story about ammonia came in. So even though it costs so much energy to make ammonia, it's considered really economically viable to deliver hydrogen by means of ammonia. So you start with the Haber-Bosch process to make the stuff in the first place, and then you put in even more energy to extract it just so we could have hydrogen on demand. So, so if you look at sort of the standard conventional ways to produce hydrogen, if we just look at this one example of steam methane reforming, of course methane is something we'd like to get rid of. We have too much methane. Uh, and so, uh, so, so this, of course, would cost a lot because it requires really high temperatures. And so for thermal uh, processes, that's the whole key with the thermal processes. They, go to the, they, they require high temperatures. So not only do they require a lot of energy, they also require very, you know, they have to be done in, sta in steel and they have to be done with a very, very high capital cost, right? Because of, because of the high temperature requirement. So high temperature, high pressure, lots of fossil fuels to run them and, um, and, and lots of capital to build something like this. So we can look at the same. So this is the steam methane reforming that I mentioned earlier, uh, where we have water and methane, um, uh, both easily accessible to CO. As Peter said, CO is not bad to produce, but then we can, can produce because we can mineralize it, and then we can produce hydrogen. So instead, why don't we build a light source? Why don't we do photocatalysis? But this is sort of the vision of photocatalysis on on an, uh, on an industrial scale and look how different it would be. So the light source could be an LED in a reactor and the temperature that's needed to produce the same amount of hydrogen is 200 degrees Celsius. You could do that in your oven, right? That's, think of the materials you can put in your oven. They're, they're, they don't require these really high temperatures. So all of a sudden, it's, not, it's completely reasonable to think about a reactor like this that could be small footprint that could be installed anywhere and that you could turn on and turn off, because you can turn on and turn off the diode, that you could actually do this to produce, to produce hydrogen, as people say, hydrogen on demand or hydrogen very easily. So, um, so we have been, <laughs> we've been advising a company um, of young, fearless uh, uh, scientists and entrepreneurs who have been pursuing this right-hand vision for, how, or for producing hydrogen on demand, and they're actually in the process of taking orders for uh, for this for for uh, 
um, uh, year 2020, orders for actually hydrogen on demand facilities. So, um, so this is some example. I'm not giving the details because they would kill me if I gave them the details of precisely what catalyst they were using. But this shows basically turning the diode off and turning the diode on again. You can see that it's actually something that uh, is, is, is very doable. And with the numbers, actually, their efficiencies are really very high. And so this is data from about a, a couple months ago. They've, in fact, increased the, their, their, their efficiencies and so on. But they can do hydrogen on off at really reasonable temperatures. And this is something that, that puts one on the scale on, on, on a roadmap to to hydrogen on demand. So we have this idea of hydrogen being too expensive. So the name of the company is Syzygy. Syzygy is, a, is, is an alignment of the planets. So they're looking at an alignment of technology with sustainability and, and, and energy. And so if, you, if they price out, which they spent a lot of time figuring out precisely what the, 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 the cost would be for this kind of commercialization. So their costs are far, far below what one sees for commercial uh, produced methane. And if one also looks at what the needs for, hyd for, for, for production equipment, you're talking about a, you know, an order of magnitude less cost for setting up a facility to do exactly what I just showed you, produce hydrogen at very reasonable temperatures. So, uh, so I, I mentioned I started with a variety of different topics, all of applications of, nano, of, of plasmonics. And so this is actually, uh, so this is Art, the, the clinician who is pioneering this effort. The man in the middle is Martin Feely. He is um, patient number one. Who's, who uh, that I described to you, and that is his wife, and we now know why they're smiling. <laughs> and I described to you some of our uh, of our efforts in uh, in desalination using uh, using light absorbing photothermal effects uh, within the context of membrane distillation, and then how we can begin to think about hydrogen on demand as not something that will happen in several decades from now, but something that might be happening within the next two years to two years to five years, and and, and that's something we're really very, very excited about. And I also have a wonderful list of collaborators. These are all of our uh, biomedical people from oh, over the years that we've worked on biomedical projects. And of course, our, our collaborators uh, at Rice um, and then and then uh, elsewhere. And this, this is a, uh, last year's photo of my students, so many of the people. So Lena and Joe is the, the guy with the plaid shirt that Peter mentioned, who's the author of the science article that he described. So with that, thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you.